in order to move this forward, it has to be recommended to council again to see if it passes or not. Is that correct? If it goes through. Yeah, so if you if you want this to proceed, uh, you have to put it back to council. Uh, you know, recommend it be referred to council. Uh, if there was information, further information that you wanted, you could direct staff to get that information. Uh, yeah, well, th that was that was my next question. Uh, it went through the process, but I'm still not quite satisfied. But uh, with information, I think there should be a little bit of direct staff to find out more information on on uh, whether this is a good thing or not that it's a bad thing, but there has to be more information on what what this is going to look like at the end if we do pass this, and where does it take off from there, right? I mean, does every every household have an opportunity to stick a shingle up and say prayer meeting here tonight, 10% discount? on your taxes, is that, that what it's going to wind up being doing? I don't, I don't know. I think we need more information. So the motion would be to direct staff to look into the tax implications? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Tax Im implications. <coughs> and perhaps at our next committee of the whole, we could uh, discuss this again. Sorry, yeah, the, the, the part of the Assessment Act that uh, provides a property exemption, exemption for churches reads in part, every church and place of worship and the land used in connection therewith and every churchyard and church burial ground and every church hall used for religious or congre congregational purposes exclusive, exclusively save only for occasion, occasions spe specially authorized by church authorities and for which no revenue in excess of $100 per annum is received, and it goes on, uh, is exempt, okay? And so I think we'd want to make sure from assessment services the way they interpret that, you know, is, you know, the question I had for, for Jerry and where he's going to try and find the answer is a lot of churches have residences for their clergy, and those residences, we need to know if those are taxed or not, or if they, or, or, or if PVC, PVSC, deems that to be a use in conjunction. And if it is, then we would assume that the residence of the person who is the clergy of, you know, who's occupying the rest of the house would, would be eligible for the exemption. And Jeff, can we have, e even though uh, I know that we sold our, our congregation at St. Ambrose sold the old Glebe house next door to somebody and then we bought a residence for a parish priest up on Pleasant Street so that would could you see if that that must follow so that must follow even though we had one it must have been exempt it was on the same property and then we bought another one we're going to find all those answers because it's it could be a Pandora's box. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So the motion. Who seconded the motion? He's good. Who seconded the motion? I think I did. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. You did now. Any more discussion? Questions. Questions been called. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Did you want, I didn't even see a light. Danny, just do the use. Because <laughs> I can't, like sometimes I don't see Danny. Okay. <clears throat> EAC recommendation. Terms of reference, proposed amendments, UNSM Towns Caucus. I thought we went through that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Councilor Landrum? But <laughs> is this on the right form? Is this the right set of amendments? Yes. This is the big concern because uh, the document that we were given was, uh, was the amendment was a little different than the other document. There were two sets, and there's a big difference between 
the, the they were amended later. So I mean, I'm I like what we've done. If something's going to happen to them, but I hate to see this go to town to um, UNSM board of directors saying, "Oh, you guys filled out the wrong form. Too no. bad." Ball, so ball, ball, ball. I think in between there. I think Lyle told me that last week because you must have called him. That's why I asked. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, he basically said there's pro there's something in there, but it's it's basic. I say it's basically the same. I guess I got to get that. Well, I thought maybe you had the. Yeah, that the one you sent. Okay, I thought it got sent. So okay. I'm going to craft a motion. <coughs> so I move that the town of Yarmouth submit our recommendations on the proposed amendments to the town caucus terms of reference in accordance to, with the document to which they gave us. Question. Has been called, all those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Carried? <coughs> Excuse me, I don't know what's wrong with me, but it's not good. Request for decision, Maud Lewis Trail Lighting. Who had this one? Okay, so this was a, uh, a uh, matter that was referred to staff. It was about lighting on the Maud Lewis Trail that goes between Parade Street and um, Stars Road along the Clements Avenue uh, Street right-of-way. And the most cost-effective way of providing some illumination along the trail would be to use existing poles uh, and to install LED lights uh, directed towards the trail. They are on what would be the other side of the road, so they would be, have to be tilted so that the, the projection from the LED streetlights would, would actually be in the direction. I did notice, I mean, there is one LED light uh, that is near the beginning of the trail on the, on the parade, parade Street end. So uh, that is, uh, that's for your consideration. The, uh, the cost would, would be fairly insignificant, uh, and it would provide some illumination uh, along that trail. If you wish to go uh, further in terms of investment, I guess the thinking was is that now that we own the entire right of way, it might not be too long before we open that street. Exactly. And if we invest in trail type lighting that you would put on a kind of a, a wooded trail, uh, it might not be too long before that lighting is actually installed along what could be a fairly busy street uh, with maybe hopefully businesses or residences or whatnot along it. So. That's for your consideration. So that's a quick and expensive, easy way to do it. Right? Get, get something in place, yeah. Okay. Councillor Orlando? Realizing that we are, of course, we've been talking about Clements Avenue extension for years, um, and I'm not getting any younger. Uh, I'm suggesting that we should light the darn thing now rather than later. Um, and furthermore, I mean, it, it, it's it's, it's active, you know, it's, it's all part of our whole model to make our community more active. And, and that's a very used path. It's a very safe path. And even if Clements Avenue does open up as a roadway, we can still use it as the link path, you know, to it. So I make a motion that this be referred to budget for consideration in the next second. fiscal year. Moved and seconded. Any more discussion? Question. Question's been called. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. <coughs> Interactive bus shelters. Thank you, Your Worship. And we all know uh, our transit service is going to start in the next couple of days and it's going to be successful and going to be well used. So I'd like to make a motion that staff be directed to come up with concepts for an interactive interpretive bus shelters and investigate alternative ways to fund these shelters. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councillor Lando? I, I, I like it. I'm just curious, what, what is an interactive, I get the interpretive bus shelter, but I'm just to the mover, I'm just asking uh, Councillor Mooney, what's an interactive well, bus shelter? Is it like a screen with a computer or? It could be games. Uh, we have the planner here and she, she's been looking at bus shelters uh, right across Canada and right across, I guess, North America and the rest of the world. And she has some ideas for bus shelters. I thought my ideas would be something like uh, one of the shelters could be like a Maud Lewis house, or one could be a lobster trap, or oh. one could be a something else. But then Caroline brought it to the next step, and she said there, she wanted to make some that were interactive. So 
Caroline's right here and she said she's going to stay. Maybe she can discuss that part because uh, the CAO over the last couple of days sent some information to myself when I requested um, about uh, the Department of Municipal Affairs, I think at that time with Mark Fury was there now that we have a new minister, um, how we can use some of the active transportation funds for, I thought we could use it for a new bus, but we can use it for a second hand bus or for some shelters or some other things. So that's some of the ways we could fund it, but then Caroline had some other ideas about what the shelters would actually be. Go ahead, Caroline. Oh, did you want to speak? No. Nope. Oh, so. It's, it was just a really fun idea. Um, I sent, I don't think I sent it to all the counselors, just the couple that I'd been talking to it, about it on the bus, but there's a whole bunch of examples all over the world of what they do is they design the shelter based on the place where it's at. So they're different in, at every stop. Um, and they're, the interactive concept is kind of that, you know, you can sit in a bus stop bored waiting for the bus. There's something to do, even if it's something little like a tic-tac-toe game or, um, I mean, it's just it's just a concept that would be really interesting to see, to design. Um, maybe even something worth engaging the architecture students at Dal to help work through or something like that. Yeah. Deputy? I guess I've already started, Caroline. I'm, I'm working with the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia and, and, the, and the pharmacy to come up with, a, I hope, an interesting design for uh, Elma Square. <laughs> so good. But this is something you can have fun with, right, Caroline? This is kind of oh, we fun need to do this. Job. Yes, absolutely, yeah. It'd be great for the town. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I know there were some years ago that I, I think my first term on council that there was, uh, there's people out there that put up these shelters and uh, it didn't go over very, very well with the committee that was sitting around the table at that time, uh, the, uh, the PAC at that time, but uh, <clears throat> they had a proposal that there was a gentleman that was in the advertising business and Phil, you had the occasion to see some of those shelters on the way going to Digby. How they do theirs, they have advertising, whatever, on, on one portion of theirs, a small advertising. And uh, they have people out there that are willing to put up. I don't know if they are or not now, but at that time there was. And uh, this gentleman was prepared to pour, pour the pads, put up the shelters. Um, he gave the pictures of the shelters and everything. They were very tasteful looking. They were similar to the ones out here by the town hall. So if there's any any information out there, I think that should be sought also if there's people out there that are willing to put up these shelters along the, uh, in, in towns or cities or whatever for a certain percentage of, of the uh, shelter itself be used for advertising, that should be looked at too. And it, it could save, save the town, the taxpayers, a lot of money if that's just only one other option uh, that that should be sought should be looked at so that's just my thought questions questions been called all those in favor aye, aye. contrary motion carried grant allocation 2016-17 cal this would be the point where you would make that motion about the 70,000 and the 305,000 for grants through organizations your Worship would like to make a motion that for the 2016-17 fiscal year that the amount of money available to grant store organizations be 70,000, 75,000, Jeff, or 70, what do we run? 70, let's go for 70,000. And for tax, tax uh, redemption would be 305,000. Moved and seconded. Why does this not go to budget? Just because? Any discussion? Go ahead. I just, I guess the question that I have, or the concern that I have, is that at seventy thousand, how much did we spend last year? Um, and I wonder if it's enough. That's all. I know that budget is tight, and and uh, and and I just wondered if we need to adjust it. The requests aren't any less than what they have been in the past, and uh, there are more because there's different activities taking place in the community. 
and I just wondered uh, what we perhaps actually spent last year, and and if if we did spend a certain dollar more than seventy thousand last year, that maybe we could consider using the last year's figure as our minimum or maximum, I should say. Jerry, are you looking at that? Have a second. Did you want to say something in the meantime? Yeah, Your Worship, I, I agree with Jim on this. Uh, I liked it when we had a bit of a cushion, uh, that we had that, I think it was $10,000. I mean, I remember when we started this council, we had an $80,000 figure, of which 70000 we spent, but we kept 10000 back for those last-minute requests that came in. And I kind of liked that. Uh, it gave us that leeway instead of saying no, no, no. I, I forget who around the table brought it up, but sometimes there's this last minute thing happens that something comes in that we luck into as a community, a major event or something that maybe the room levy won't work, won't exactly uh, solve or won't help them with their funding. So it gives us that little cushion. Um, so that's, I don't know if we can work that in. It would be nice to see that back because that gives us that little edge because right now, once the 70,000 is expended, we're done for the year. That's in essence. Uh, you could allocate 60 now and save 10 for later. It, you know, but in, in, all, in all honesty, and I, I, I agree, I mean, you, you want to be able to do the best you can. I love the cushion, but I also, I also feel very strongly that, that um, we shouldn't be the first place they come to. And, and often we are. And, and so I think two years ago, somebody sat here and my question was, do you need the money? Well, no. And, and yet we gave the money anyway and it just, it, it blew my mind. So we have to be careful to pay attention to, um, to what they're saying in their applications. Have they gone somewhere else? Are they looking for money elsewhere? Are they you know, looking for sponsors? And I think the town is tapped out too as far as sponsors go. Everybody's getting tapped out, but um, I, I mean, I'm easy either way, but. Yeah, the last two years pretty consistent. Um, just a few hundred dollars under seventy thousand both years. A few under seventy. Yeah, okay. so basically seventy thousand. I think last year though, wasn't there one for a couple thousand dollars? They returned it, Linda, because they said they ended up not needing it. Yeah. But could be. Uh, yeah, the shark family didn't, didn't do, do their thing. Got the event back. Okay, you're on. Yeah, the other thing to your worship that kind of bothers me sitting around the table too long, um, we have the same organizations coming back. It's like, a, a, I mean, I spoke with a couple of these organizations already and they're back again. Um, it's suggesting, you know, hey, you know, we're not like the ever group. And I don't know, maybe it's time that we looked at the policy. You know, today's not the day to say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll entertain you for, say, three years, but after that you have to take a year off literally, uh, before we entertain you again. I don't know. I, I mean, we've been funding the same groups and same groups and same groups and same groups, which is fine. I mean, there are certain events like Seafest. That's a very valid event. I mean, they, they do very good things for this community. They bring a lot in. But there's a lot of groups that have a very, they're like a closed club. They're a small group that service their members or service a particular area. And you're kind of wondering, is this the good use of taxpayers' money? Maybe we should put a policy in place that says, okay, you know, if you, if you are starting an event or an organization or you're doing something and you can't become self-sustainable in five years, something's wrong with what you're doing. You should be able to, to balance. I mean, the Knights of Columbus comes here looking for money for their taxes, which is fair ball, and that's, that's fair, but they don't come looking for money to support their club or their organization. Um, you, know, that's, that's, you know, that's where I'm having problem. These groups are coming in every year, every year as you say your worships. So I don't know, it's something, uh, it kind of bothers me that we keep looking at the same group all the time. Maybe it's time that we should try to suggest they become a little bit more sustainable or maybe more imaginative in getting funding. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, <clears throat> reading some of the uh, requests from different organizations, the nonprofit and for profit, whatever, it always, always. I have, uh, I, I read some of them, and, and I listened to the, to the people that came here and they gave presentations and stuff. And I've asked some of them different questions. So I said, so what do you do with the money and stuff? And some of them 
always usually carry a balance, not a big balance, but some of them do carry balances. And some of them you say, well, we use the money, we give them out for prizes and we award different things for chari not other charities and stuff. So the money that they get from us goes to give to other people. And it, it shouldn't work like that. It really shouldn't work like that because this A, this AAA or AA hockey tournament, stuff like that, that's, to me, that's, that's pretty legitimate. They want to bring people in and they want to have a function in that here. That's great. Not that the other ones are not, but it just, it just don't make a whole lot of sense that you would want to take money from the taxpayers and give it to some other organizations that are part of what you're trying to fund and, and raise money to, to give away. And it, it, it doesn't work like that. But giving, going a, a $10,000 bumper for late comers or whatever comers, you know, I got a little problem with that because <coughs> if we're going to do that, then we're going, we're reversing what we said a year or two years ago that we keep money back and hold money back and, uh, because people didn't, didn't come and they didn't put in uh, for their grants to organizations, and so uh, we're going to allow $10,000. We're going to give people another opportunity to you get the grants from organizations. That's already ended in January the 31st, but if you come after that or you, there's some functions that are taking place, uh, whatever, whatever, uh, then you can come and you can qualify for funding maybe if you give a presentation to council. I think that that may, might be opening up another Pandora's box. I think, you know, times are, times are tough, times are hard. Uh, the town needs a lot, a lot, a lot of things, and they need a lot of, of organizations coming forward to give their presentations and seek funding, but there's only, only enough money to go around for, you know, a once, a one time. And if you're going to extend the grants to organizations, then we ought to have a different policy put in place where we have one for January the 31st and one for September the 31st or December the 31st, whatever. And I'm, I'm not for that either, but it, it, you, we're, we're trying to create two different scenarios, two different types of funding here. Uh, and, and I don't think we should be going down that road. So I think we should give this some really careful thought. It's nice to be considerate and look ahead for other people coming forward looking for funding, but you know, there's, there's lot, lots of things that need to be done here in the town of Yarmouth, and one is not always supplying the right amount of money or cash for everybody that wants to come and, and bring their proposals forward. Sometimes you just have to say no and we're sorry, but perhaps if you go the route that we have for funding that we already have in place, that's the route you should be going. Councilor Mooney? Yeah, and just looking at it, Your Worship, I think there's three of these requests on the, uh, the sheet, sheet this year that are going towards um, paying the rent out of the Mariner Center, right? We got the Hallabaloo and we have the Relay for Life that we're paying, you know, they're out raising funds for, for the Cancer Society and they're out raising funds for the uh, Hospital Foundation and we're paying a part of or a portion of the rent for the Mariner Center. So. Um, it raises an interesting point. And then you have other situations where we want to, and you hear it all the time, and you see it on Facebook all the time, is, is you know, Yarmouth could have had the uh, Wharf Rat Rally, but we all know that, That's not you know, Glenn, Glenn back up in Digby um, created that event and ran with it and, and became very successful. But here we are. We're trying to get an event that's comparable to the Wharf Rat Rally. And we had a very successful event last year in the... Um, in the Roaring, Roaring Antique Car Club uh, had 5,000 people down on Main Street on Friday and Saturday, and they were looking for $11,000, and I gave them, uh, in my grant application, I gave them all $11,000 because I think we should give that event every opportunity to, to grow and to match what they have in Digby, right? So um, I concentrated my grant application process to things like Councilor McIsaac said to the Bantam AA Hockey Championships that's coming to Yarmouth, the uh, Roaring Antiques Auto Club, the things that are going to bring people to the town of Yarmouth. Even though um, I think we short-shifted them the last couple of years, we have uh, at one time was the largest funded tourism project in Nova Scotia was the Wedgeport Tuna, Tuna, Festival. Tuna Festival. At one time, the Department of Tourism used to give those guys $40,000 a year. 
This was all over the world. And here, last year, they asked for $1,000. You know what we gave them? 200 right? And they draw literally thousands of people to Wedgeport over two days, right? I gave them the full amount last year, and I'm giving them the full amount this year. But I've geared my grants at organizations that are going to bring, bring people to town and yard. We have a couple other things in there, and I see Frank here. Um, it's very important that we have two teams going away this year. Frank, where are you guys going this year? Medicine Hat, um, they're going to represent Yarmouth. They won the Canadian Championship last year. That event probably brought in close to a million dollars to the town of Yarmouth last year, the over 35 baseball championships. They can't wait to come back here every year. And we also have a team, and even though it's got a funny name, the Yarmouth Barking Squirrel Slow Pitch Team, they're going to British Columbia this year representing Yarmouth. They've got 15 or 16 girls or ladies are going to British Columbia to represent the town of Yarmouth in the national championship. Those kind of things, when you send them to other communities, they're going to be ambassadors for us. So it makes it hard, you know. Um, we haven't had a tax increase since we've been around the table in, Ken, seven years. We haven't increased taxes. And we all know what Jeff says, the cost of municipal government goes up 9% a year. I don't know. We are either the first or the last resort for people coming and ask for grants to organizations. Municipal government, like I said earlier, isn't built in a vacuum or isn't built in a, com in a box, right? Um, there's going to be events. People are going to come in. Tina's son's going to be on a hockey tournament that's going to, you know, get the Atlantic Championships. You might be coming here in September or November or October, have an invitational tournament. Those are outside the realm of what this falls under. So it's a hard situation. We have very limited resources. We have $70,000 to give out, and we have $217,896 in requests. How much? $217,896 in requests, and we have $70,000 to give out. And if you do the big ones, like what the coal shed is, they want fifteen to 17000 You know, you give ten or 12000 to CFES, ten or 12000 to uh, the YARC, the eleven or twelve thousand that they want for the Roaring Antique Car Club. Guess what? You only got out of forty organizations, you only got twenty thousand dollars out of forty organizations to give money to. You know, it's 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 a hard situation. They're not fun to fill out. Um, there's gonna be winners and losers, but I'm, I don't count them as winners and losers. They have to be sustainable and they have to go out and look for alternative ways to raise money, but it's hard. Yeah, it does make sense. Okay. Councillor Landro? Well, the other concern I have is the, on the other flip side, is the $305,000 tax thing, um, where we've got groups, and I'm looking, I'm not naming groups, but there are groups in that list, I suggest, who get money from various other partners, it's the federal government or the provincial government, through grants. And I've filled in a fair chunk of these over the years, and I recall seeing in any grant application, a, a set for taxes. In many cases, you were able to put in your grant request if you're putting in taxes or an item. Now, I don't know whether they're still doing it or not, but you know, when I'm looking at, you know, I, some are legit, for example, the Lions Club or the Columbus Club, they're all nonprofit, they're not involved. But then there's some other groups who do have a fair amount of income coming in from grants and from provincial level or projects, et cetera. And in the good old day, they used to be have a, a certain little cushion there for taxes. And yet, they're asking for 100%. And I really have an issue with that because I'm just wondering how many of these groups are paying money to pay their taxes, yet are not paying their taxes and coming to us and that money is being used as part of their operating amount. So that is, that is, a, that is a concern that I've always had. And I'm thinking, okay, we, we, we're very generous in that regard, but on the other hand, um, you know, you look at the Aramith and Town and County Sports Heritage Association, we're giving them a grant. They don't own their, they own their building. Um, they own their building, but then I, oh yeah, they've asked for in lieu of taxes. So they've asked for a grant in lieu of taxes. So they're coming in twice. They want, um, they want a grant for their operation, and then on the other hand, they're coming in looking for a tax break as well. And that's not the only one. So, you know, there's only so much money that we can give, and I mean, that's, it, it, is a, it is a concern. I mean, I'd like to help them all out, but as uh, Phil pointed out, you've got 220, almost thousand dollars in requests here. Uh, somebody's gonna get disappointed, and it's unfortunate, but I don't know, and then you have some groups who are asking for 
uh, status who, uh, for assistance, who just inherited a fair chunk of change. You know, and you kind of look at that as well, you know. So, and to me, if, if the bottom line in a group, and we always base this on need. We've always based we, this on, yeah, we always have based it on need. But some of those groups have money. Yeah, the applications don't come in based on need. No, they're not anymore. But we used to, in the good old days, have it based on need. In other words, hey, we are losing money every year in this event. You know, yeah. you take the coal shed festival, a good example. For the amount of money they collect for the food bank, it would be, I always said this, it would be cheaper for us to cut a check for the amount of the PA system rental, give it to the food bank, life would be good. Because they get a heck of a lot more through our check than they would through all the work that Phil does. But we all know the Coal Shed Festival brings in all kinds of attention, makes the waterfront vibrant. It's a very good investment, you know, that we do. So I don't know. I, I really think we, we, probably not us, the new council, um, should really look at this whole grants organizations thing. Look at the whole where they're going, where we're going with it. Because I really think it's something we've always said. One of these things, we've always done it, always done it, always done it, always done it. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have to always do it. We may want to just take a little second chance and see what's going on there. Just, just my thought. I agree. OK. So was there a motion? Because I'm just. 70 and 305. OK, moved and seconded. Any more discussion? Question has been called. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Contrary? I think one question for Jeff. Motion though. carried. Go ahead. If I'm reading this right, Jeff, when you go to uh, tax request and the grand total is 305000 on the back, 305000 so on the, the total requested is 298,418,36, so we could do 100% on every one, right? That's best based on last year's tax? <coughs> So we can give, I just got to ask this, so we can give 100%, <coughs> but you don't have to. No. Right? Because I don't, I, I don't think I've ever given 100. Okay. That's right. Okay. So the motion's passed. We're good now. Next. <coughs> Request for decision smoking and vaping bylaw amendment. Your Worship, we've had some help with this. And uh, Caroline, could you could you introduce our helpers and uh, maybe talk just briefly about how they came to be our helpers? And uh... so this is Raleigh and Jake. Raleigh and Jake both have uh, planning degrees from Dalhousie University. Raleigh is my little brother and Jake graduated with Raleigh. And they were looking to get some experience uh, in working in a municipal environment, and they volunteered to come down and work with me for, the mo for a month, and they're actually living with me as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Jeff, I, I mentioned this to Jeff, and he was pretty eager to get some bylaws looked at, and that's what they've been doing for him. You guys have been here, what, almost two weeks now? Yeah. Yep, so they, this is a report they put together. Certainly. So beca because one of their goals was to, was to experience the process, we wouldn't look, normally bring bylaw stuff to Committee of the Whole. We'd bring it to Council, but um, you know, I wanted them to, to have the experience of presenting information to you on the bylaw side, and uh, they may get the opportunity if they're around in two weeks on Thursday night to come to a Council meeting. But at least I want them to have the opportunity to explain what they've done and uh, to field any questions you may have about uh, what their recommendations are. I don't seem to have it. Oh, okay. You don't? Okay, good. All right. Not good that you don't have it, but good that. Um, did you want to say something before they start? No, you want to shock, he said. I think it's the most I've ever talked in my life. This this the smoking bylaw here. Now this is something that you two looked at and prepared. Yeah. This is not uh, okay. Okay, I got gotcha. you. 
this is it's a recommendation the council now has the solicitor had a chance that was one of my questions to look at this and uh, he probably hasn't are we going to deal with this today or is this just, just an exercise for the well it's it's an exercise to to understand what their direction is on this where they're recommending yeah. you go yeah. uh, now now this came from council you remember uh, mr yes. good at yes. his presentation yeah, yeah. Uh, was the recommendation of council yeah. staff work with mr good and his yeah. committee to come up yeah. with a, a bylaw that's right uh, so I asked, he, he he asked and we we and you, and you directed we directed and you directed staff and so uh, I asked Raleigh and and the uh, yeah. Jake to to do that and so they met with well I'll let you t I'll let them talk about what they did but yeah. no uh, this has been very compressed work in a short period of time yeah. so the solicitor has not had a chance to review it this yeah. is more about uh, what what they're recommending in terms of the approach okay. and the specifics and then we'll we'll have the solicitor yeah. review it before it goes yeah because I, I'm I'm reading reading it here and uh, it says something about any sidewalks immediate lots and uh, uh, own town owned property this that I mean we talked we talked a whole lot of stuff that night a whole lot of things were mentioned and we talked our, ourselves and stuff and through recreation and, and different signage and a whole bunch of stuff and I see a lot of that in here and and within so many meters and all the other good stuff it's in here it looks it looks pretty compact it looks you guys got a lot of work on it uh, but my only concern is that is this enforceable as our solicitor had at Apple time to look at it we haven't had time to really look at it and if this is just an exercise and have to look at it and we can refer it to another committee the whole or whatever it would be more tasteful for me than okay. just to make any kind of decision on this today okay gentlemen you have the floor um, all right as in regards to um, compliance um, there was a study done in Bridgewater. Um, they implemented a smoke-free outdoor spaces bylaw, and they had 86% of smokers in the area rep reported voluntary compliance. Oh, sorry. Um, the town of Bridgewater implemented a smoke-free outdoor spaces, and 86% uh, of the smokers uh, reported voluntary compliance. So that would address your uh, issue that you had um, with enforcement. So we're hoping that it is self-enforced through like people saying like, hey, you're not allowed to smoke in this area. There's a sign right there. So um, as it says in uh, this, we're focusing on self-enforcement, um, but it does mention a, a number or section um, uh, seven. Um, anyone that violates this bylaw is guilty offense punishable on summary conviction so it would be dependent on Section 7 says any person who violates uh, this bylaw is guilty of an offense punishable on summary conviction. But as we said earlier, we want to, the, to focus on education and self-compliance rather than uh, making uh, the community feel like they're being prosecuted. So it would depend on the situation. Anyway, I, I told her this on the phone. Answer that question. It, can they walk down the street? So um, if you t say, for instance, we set a nine meter buffer from, because Raymond had requested that we do specific streets, and that didn't, uh, uh, it didn't um, account for like um, economic, economic development. So. 
say for instance, if someone is walking down the street, uh, main street, we set the nine meter buffer basically to eliminate smoking on the main street and to put it off to side streets because each um, entrance would basically pass through the other buffer, therefore making the entire street basically uh, eliminating smoke free, or smoking, sorry. Okay. Th Sandy, did you get your question answered? Yeah. You were just looking for that, that uh, section. CAO? <coughs> no, I'll hold my. You're gonna hold on? Okay. So, so what you're saying, Main Street's gonna be non-smoking. From a where to section. where? <laughs> but what was that? It, it's dependent on the entrances. So any portion of Main Street that does not have a commercial entrance could be exempt from that, but it's predominantly okay. most of the Main Street. And you said in Bridgewater, for example, in Bridgewater, 86% of the people are self-policing. Yeah, oh, well, 86% uh, of smokers in the area reported voluntary compliance. Okay. So. It's a big number. Well, not a big number, it's just like that. No, 86% of people saying, okay, I get this, I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm not gonna smoke in these areas. Huh? Yeah, I don't know, I'd, I'd say they wouldn't, has a light on. You do first. Yeah, okay. And then Ken. So, you know, my, my issue, and I expressed it when Raymond was here, was, was the idea of having a bylaw that you, that you can't enforce, right? That you're unable to, we don't have the resources to enforce. Uh, I tend to, to get squeamish around that stuff because I, I see the emails and I hear the criticism when we can't uh, effectively enforce uh, bylaws that we have, and, and a classic example would be the uh, the noise bylaw, right? When we get complaints about about vehicles that are excessively noisy, and you know we're we're we have trouble explaining to the public that the that the intent is to set a standard. Uh, no, we can't necessarily enforce it, but it's it's kind of setting a standard that we expect uh, you know uh, residents to to respect uh, to to live close together and and respect to one another's uh, uh, privacy and whatnot. So uh, that sometimes isn't enough to satisfy all, and so we get the criticism of having bylaws we can't enforce. Uh, you know, there have been lots of examples of, of municipalities imposing, or passing, I should say, bylaws that I wouldn't think are enforceable. <clears throat> but they've had good success with them in terms of educating their communities around a standard they'd like to see the community live up to, and Bridgewater and that and that bylaw might may be one example. I know Wolfville's passed some uh, smoking bylaws in the past that uh, that have uh, later been followed by provincial legislation. So, you know, they got out on the leading edge of some stuff, and and I don't think they could enforce what they passed, but but in fact it it, it created a, a higher level of consciousness. So I'm concerned about that part of the bylaw uh, because I, I'm more I am I tend to be more uh, aware perhaps of the criticisms that come when you can't enforce. Uh, but, but I do also recognize that, that, that we have a community that, that uh, uh, will rally around certain things. Um, the one part in here I wanted to draw to your attention, which, I, which came up in the discussion we had, was, was the whole idea of ma mandatory signage. So if we believe that education is, is probably, is perhaps the, uh, the route to more more awareness around where smoking is inappropriate and so on. If you look at section six, it talks about mandatory signage must be placed on all commercial businesses, town or public property as listed in section five of the bylaw. So in all the areas where smoking is prohibited, there would have to be signage. So it would be an offense in the bylaw not to have a sign. Yeah, we're in the wrong. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, there was an update that came, I think I was already in the meeting here when it came, and, it, and it, I'll, I'll just read the section to you. Uh, apologize, and again, we, we deal with this at council, you'll have it. It says, mandatory signage must be placed on all commercial businesses, town, or public property as listed in section five of the bylaw. So all the areas where smoking is prohibited, it would be an offense not to have it posted. Now we could go an extra mile and say, look, we, we can provide the signage 
we can provide the signs, maybe discounted, maybe do a bulk buy, whatever. So you would post a sign outside the, the entrance to your business that says, you know, ordinance whatever of the town of Yarmouth, prohibit smoking within nine meters of, of uh, this entryway. Like they have the hospital, you know, and, and not everybody is, not everybody is going to obey it. Not everybody is, but you know, uh, not everybody obeys any law, right? Uh, that's why we have guys like Greg. And <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes people break laws. But the vast majority of people respect, respect laws and respect one another and would, would just putting a sign, more signs up in the community reminding people that there are laws around this might lead to more education, more awareness and more compliance. Just a thought. Just looking at this, um, when this was dropped, I'm just curious, do we have any properties in town that does not have a nine meter clearance in the front or a nine meter clearance in the back? What I'm thinking of, is it possible that we would have a property owner that has a house positioned, say, eight meters from the street and has a backyard of nine meters? Therefore, that person, according to this bylaw, could not smoke on his own property. Am I right or wrong? Is that my interpretation right or wrong? If I have a lot of land and I'm thinking of a house right now that fits this criteria, I buy my house, I have about eight meters to the street, and my backyard is a really weird backyard, it has very narrow. Technically, I wouldn't be able to go out and smoke on my property, is that correct? So um, we actually noticed this correction. You're talking, referring to uh, section 5D, right? Um, we actually noticed that we made the, a mistake there and we need to include uh, commercial and town properties in that definition. So to not limit residential because we can't take that right from them. Because section 4B clearly states no smoking means any portion of any sidewalk or any portion of land within the street right of way. So that section that you just referred to as under five, whatever it is, would be in conflict with that. Sorry, which? So under your interpretation, 4B states no smoking area means any portion of any sidewalk or any portion of land within the street right, right of way. So if I live at 57 Clements Avenue, I cannot walk out my front door and smoke on the sidewalk. However, uh, and that's, that's in the interpretation part. No, and no, then, no, sorry. that's the way I would read it. That, yes. So you would not be able to smoke in front of your house, for example. Uh, no, that's just talking about the smoking area specifically. So like, uh, say, a playground, you're not allowed to smoke on that street. That no, but 4B states, in this bylaw, no smoking area means any portion of a sidewalk or portion of land within the street right of way. So therefore, yeah, I come out my front door, there's not nine meters from my front door to the sidewalk. I can't, not that there's a sidewalk in front of my house, there isn't, thank God. So that's good because I don't want a sidewalk. So if there's no sidewalk in front of the house, you can smoke. <laughs> that's good. I never just realized that. But if hypothetically there was a sidewalk, I could not, in accordance with 4B, go outside and stand on my sidewalk in front of my house and smoke. Or my guests could not because my guests know that I'm deathly allergic to cigarette smoke, so they all go out on the, the street. So that, luckily there's no sidewalk. Or, but it's a portion of land, so I guess they get me under the portion of land. So they can no longer smoke out front of my house in accordance with 4B. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, the, our intention was for it to adhere to the Smoke Free Places Act in Nova Scotia. So that's the next line right after that, right? Um, that says that within four meters of any entrance, you cannot, it's four meters of any entrance, you cannot um, smoke. But that also does not include a residential area. It, it just defines uh, like a commercial space, public space, or uh, uh, town-owned property. So we're not, ta we're talking about specific areas. This isn't the whole town. No, it's this not, is just it does not include the residential areas. Yeah. <clears throat> so you're oh, so help me out, Your Worship. Where does it say that? So th this is just a definite, the, the interpretation is just the uh, defining a non-smoking area, so it's, say I designate a playground to be a non-smoking uh, area, then no one can smoke on that adjacent street or plot of land. 
It, it's the areas that are already predefined in the Nova Scotia, the provincial government's yeah. no smoking law. But, but our bylaw does not make reference to that. You could have a very zealous enforcement officer say you're smoking in front of your house in accordance with 4B, you could be charged. That's what I'm suggesting in a, under a bylaw. The way it's worded, I'm into the wording. Yeah, I understand. That was my own, that's my only concern. It's in the wording. Yeah. And I just, I, I'm just asking, is that the intent? And I see it says this area must, these area, this area must adhere to the Nova Scotia Smoke Free Purpose Places Act. No person shall smoke in a non-smoking area. Of course, we already decided a no smoking area, which means any portion of a sidewalk or portion of land within a street right of way, which would mean people smoking in front of my house. No. Because you have to put the Nova Scotia smoke-free places together. Yeah. That has to be clarified. That's my point. I'm confused. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Okay. So just just so that people understand, we're just going to add in the the smoke-free places. Okay. Anything else? So what do we need to do with this today? Okay. Go ahead. It's all about wording. It's all wording. Yeah. Now, in yeah. some parts it says non-smoking, in other parts it says no smoking. And I'm not a smoker. Is are you a no smoker or a non-smoker? Uh, are you, you referring to section four B again? Oh, just different parts because I'm thinking, oh, what does the smoke free? And then they say smoke free. So there's three bits of language: no smoking, non-smoking, and smoke free. I'm just thinking we should be consistent with whatever in the wording. So maybe smoke-free areas, or I'm not sure what the language is, but I'm just a language nut, that's all. So basically, one of two things, either, either it's all the same or they are defined <coughs> separately if okay. they mean different things. So we would have to have that in there if it's different. <coughs> What's that? Yeah, that's just an excuse. Don't go there with me. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Well, no, it doesn't give you a right. <coughs> uh, I mean, technically, by the way that we have this bylaw address right now, it would, it would also not be allowed to smoke because it says in the first definition where we define smoking that it includes, uh, like, all smoking products, not just tobacco. Do you want to put your light on? I just have a concern about the main street. The other ones look, look the other ones look all, not too bad. You can have some discussion on it, but I, I don't think it should be myself personally limited to main, main street. Just to, uh, to make make main street a non-smoking area. In our recommendation, we don't make uh, main street a non-smoking area. It should basically do that by itself by setting a nine-meter buffer around each entrance. It should connect. Together. Well, you're just talking about business that don't, the business that the, the employees that come out and in front of their businesses smoke, they're not going to be allowed to do that. Yeah. But if I'm walking by their business, I can smoke. No. So if I'm walking down Main Street, I can't smoke if no, I'm a you, smoker. You would have to go off to a side road. That was so that's, that that's where I have the problem. Not, not that, that's my, it's my problem, not your problem. You put it in there. But, but uh, I, I don't, I think that's a big that, that's a big problem for the town of Yarmouth. I think. Well, the, I, I, I just want to understand why. why, why well, because if pe people that do smoke and walk up and down town that smoke, uh, why should they or why would they think that they have to go on a side street and not continue to walk on Main Street and to, to smoke? <coughs> that that would be the problem. It, it would be like uh, I bought the packs of cigarettes. I paid my taxes and that on them. That's part of my habit is. I have a bad, bad habit or good habit, call it what you want, but if, for me to smoke my cigarette, I can't continue my walk with my friends to walk down Main Street uh, because it's a non-smoking area. That's, that's it in a nutshell. And I think, I think <laughs> personally that that's, a, that's another Pandora's box, myself personally. And I don't think we're setting any big uh, number one standards here by, by doing that. Um, in, in this case, we know that uh, the Nova Scotia Smoke-Free Places law already restricts four meters around every entrance anyways, so that would 
effectively have made Main Street anyways a smoke-free area. This is just making the businesses have signs to enforce it. Yep. Any more questions for the gentleman? Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Did you have fun? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's what's important. CAO? So they're, they're also working on our uh, updating our solid waste bylaw and maybe uh, by the time uh, the council rolls around that may be ready for your review. But uh, anyway, they've got a couple, couple irons in the fire. Thanks, guys. Good stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Does anybody need a five-minute break? Go ahead. I just noticed, uh, just reading the smoke-free um, whatever act, and they, they specify in that those four meters, it's to places of employment. So maybe that wording should be put in there because they make specific reference into the Smoke Free Places Act to places of employment. And therefore, wing nuts like me worried about people smoking in front of my house. They can smoke. They can smoke in front of my house all the time they want. They just can't smoke in front of places of employment unless they're employed there. Okay. Request for direction, Bell Alliance. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We're almost finished, so we're going to plow through, but that's a long meeting, huh? Okay, good. Caroline? So the recommendation is that it's recommended the town engage the Collier's International Rep and proceed with the next steps for the project with regard to the expansion of wireless network. The, the wireless network expansion. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Question. Questions been. If she wants to. Say anything, but I think we get it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The idea is Bell Alliant would like to put in these, this new technology that'll increase our wireless network in the town, and they've offered to work with us to find areas where the wireless connection isn't good and put them in around town. Excellent. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Aye. Motion carried. That was easy. <laughs> Thank you. Anything that uh, that ups the ante on that? <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. <laughs> Okay, correspondence for action, choice housing committee, reaffordable housing, and the municipal planning strategy. Oh, you got to put a light on. I won't be able to. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, go ahead. Regarding the uh, Bell Alliance upgrade, will that help us with our Wi-Fi at all, mm. you think? Who's, who's Wi-Fi? The town's Wi-Fi. Um, I wonder. Just if there Maybe. Was I don't know. I haven't engaged with them on on the specifics further because I wanted to make sure council was interested before I moved forward That's so okay. I can get you that information if that's you're fine. okay with me reaching out thanks very much Carol no that's yeah good did you want to speak to this to the letter from choice mm -hmm. I I can um, I've been Pretty much any group in town that'll have me, I've been going and presenting to them. So I do, I've been, I've been on a roll like almost one a week <laughs> lately. Uh, so I presented to Choice Housing and I'm actually, I attend their meetings fairly regular anyway, about what's going on with the Municipal Planning Strategy Review. And uh, they liked what they heard and they wanted to know what they could do to support me. And I said, well, it doesn't hurt to let council know. So <laughs> that's <laughs> where this letter originated from. So do we need to do anything with this? <coughs> Good. Okay. Uh, Yarmouth and Area Community Fund Re-Kindness Meters. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. She came in to speak to me about that. I absolutely area. love this. <coughs> I think this is the best thing since sliced bread, if we can find the meters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we sold them. <laughs> <laughs> we keep a lot of stuff for lunch. <laughs> Can we check the fridge for the <laughs> Anyway, I, I thank your worship that uh, I'd like to make a motion that we direct staff to inquire 
into uh, the availability or a cost of used meters <coughs> for the installation as proposed by the Yarmouth Community Fund. Just to put it on the floor. It's two or three of them, if we can find some. I don't Basically, the intention is, is they're going to put these traffic meters, and what towns have done, have taken traffic meters, put them on poles, stuck them on the street, painted them a color, red or whatever, blue or something very obvious, and people would put donations in these meters, and they would be to go to the community fund, and it would help support the community fund, which is a great idea, or any fund. I think it's a wonderful idea. People can put them out front of Tim Hortons when people hope lose change. Perfect. Or gym store. No, they don't come to a gym store with any change. So who seconded that? Yeah. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Any more discussion? Call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. The motion was to direct staff to look into. Yes. Yes, that's, that's all. And they don't come for a grant either. They don't come for a grant, so that's good. <laughs> they give it away, exactly. Yarmouth Golf and Country Club water and sewer charges. ZAO, you're on. Yes, yeah, so this, at this point is for information. I think I emailed you a few weeks back about uh, the fact that uh, as our sewer rights have been increasing, we've had a number of inquiries about uh, how do you get exempt from your sewer charges when the water you use does not go into the sewer system and we do have a bylaw provision in our sewer charges bylaw for that where the engineer has to be satisfied by their uh, to, to his satisfaction has to be uh, convinced that the water is not going into the system by a certain percentage and then I think he makes a recommendation to council on that so this is just an example uh, we have also had inquiries from uh, a, a business uh, from a government institution and uh, so just to make you aware that the provision in the bylaw is now becoming uh, coming to people's attention as our sewer rates are increasing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a valid question but just just a thought there's fish plants and stuff and uh, other industrial places along Water Street that probably have asked and perhaps received this or whatever. So some sometimes, uh, not all the time, but mostly in the summer, a lot of these these plants offload water into the harbor. So now here we have a, we're restricted and we could be severely penalized if from the outfall, from our outfall that comes out of our treatment plant down on Water Street, if anything comes out of that, we could be severely charged or whatever through the Department of Environment. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is we have a tidal harbor that comes in and goes out. Everything that goes into the harbor, I would suggest that it flows outward past our, our intake or out, outtake valve. So where's that going to leave us if, the, if that water that they doesn't go into their sewer goes into their goes into the harbor and we, they start doing tests and things show up along our, our line or in the harbor. Has that ever been thought about or looked at? Not that, I, not that I'm, I'm against them getting a, a, a tax exempt or whatever, but I think there should be some caution there, whatever, just a thought. Yeah, the, the, um, the testing and the reporting that goes to environment uh, from our plant uh, doesn't come from the end of the pipe doesn't come from the, out in the harbor, right? So it, it comes from, from within the operation is my understanding. And so, uh, you know, it's a valid point that, that you know, we, we, we are under strict regulation in terms of our effluent. And it's going to get a lot stricter, as you know. We've talked about that before. Uh, you know, there are, there are businesses, fairly significant businesses, that use a lot of water. And they're the byproduct of their operation, some of it, goes directly into the harbor. We don't know how much treatment it, it receives. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is, is that we do have the provision in the bylaw, and uh, one of those operations, I don't know if it's more than one, but one of those operations does have uh, the benefit of, of that provision in our bylaw to be exempt from sewer charges for, for part of their water consumption. A different, so they have two services. Um, we have had an application from another such business uh, 
um, as I said, a, a government agency, and the, I don't mind telling you, uh, at this point, uh, the uh, Department of Transportation. I don't know if you've noticed how they're dealing with ICE uh, this year, but they have, last year they started using a, a premix brine that they spread on the roads before the ice occurs, and so when the ice occurs, it activates the brine residue and, and the salt is there. Uh, so they use a lot of water. They've actually uh, got a larger water meter put in to, to fill the brine tank. Uh, but all of that water ends up on the on the roadways throughout the county, uh, none of it in town, and uh, so they've they've requested uh, consideration for for that uh, water service not to be charged the uh, the sewer rate uh, the the consumption rate. So uh, you know that's an example. Uh, obviously, the one that I shared with you through the agenda, but. Uh, you know, what, how this will impact us is, and not that any of those are unfair or unreasonable, but how this will impact us uh, has to do with when we, when we did our, had our sewer rate study done and it projected, uh, you know, here's, here's how you should phase out or phase, phase up your rates, I guess, to, to, uh, to get to full uh, self-sustaining operation, these changes uh, change the water on the beans a little bit, right? Because these are fairly big meters uh, that we're talking about, so the charges would be fairly significant. Uh, so you know, we'll have to adjust adjust some of our assumptions around that. I just wanted you to be aware that that it's we've sort of reached that tipping point where the questions are starting to be asked. Yeah, I know it's come up at the waterfront meeting the last couple of meetings. Uh, uh, one of the operations, uh, Scotia Garden, is is concerned, and I know they want to explore uh, options for 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 better treatment. Uh, I I got this sense, and I could be I could could have misunderstood, but I thought there was there was some filtering or something of the effluent before it goes into the harbor for scales or something. Yeah. Okay. So I haven't had the tour, but. Uh, uh, it is on, on their <coughs> radar. Press my mic. Yes. Yeah, you know, there was a lot of discussion around that. It has been for a number of years, like these, uh, the, the, when they offload their, their herring and stuff in the summertime. I mean, we have, we have uh, a yacht, places where yachts and boats uh, congregate and tie up and that, and that's, there, it's not a good spot for million dollar vessels, and uh, when, when they leave, they take a lot of uh, sorts and sludge and everything with them that's on their vessel because of the offload. Now, I, I, I don't want to lose the industry, but I don't want to lose the yachting. I think there's, there could be a compromise where it was suggested where there would be a, a tunnel or a tube put out in the, in the, when they're offloading here and whatever, so it would go out towards more in, into the middle of the harbor than right down at the, by, by the ends of the wharfs and stuff. So hopefully that the waterfront waterfront development would be looking at that or we will look at that as uh, part of something that we can help help the industry with and uh, perhaps come draw up some plans or something just a thought uh, Danny just for your information the waterfront uh, corporation is setting up has set up a committee to look at that this and uh, I think Jeff is on that committee Next, I, uh, next item is the Adopt a Book Campaign April Fool's Trivia Challenge. So we'll need uh, we'll need some some people to participate if the town is going to participate. I assume we are as as uh, I think defending champs. We have to show up the yeah. So. April 1st. April 1st. Yeah, April Fool's challenge. We should make a, a commitment with the team <coughs> and members to be determined uh, which, which, which. 
So is it agreed we'll put a team in? Uh, do we need a, a motion for a team to enter and then uh, and then we'll and Linda, uh, Linda will assemble a team. So we have a motion and a seconder. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded. Motion carried. Additions. We have under additions. We have the Bantam A Provincial. Do you want to come back, Your Worship? Yeah. So we have a that was put on the agenda. Uh, a Bantam A request, I think, is what we're dealing with. Is that right? So the request has come in. Uh, it uh, the event is actually in next fiscal year. So uh, you you could deal with it one of two ways. You could you could you incorporate as part of your grants uh, to organizations for that fiscal year. Um, yeah, the event is in April. Next fiscal year. Right? Oh, it's this. It's it's April the seventh. 2016, 2016, yeah. No, it's next fiscal year. April 1st is the turnover, right? So, so that's when your grants to organizations, that's the fiscal year that your grants are for. So you could incorporate in your consideration for grants to organizations, if you wish. This is for 2000, okay. Look at what's on, I'm gonna have to come take control. <laughs> what is information? <laughs> I'm just yeah, teasing. Uh, your worship, your light is on. I, I, was just, I was just gonna say we need to have the motion to put it in with the, with the uh, budget for this year, with the grants to organizations. Do we know the amount? Do we know, do we know the amount that we're? 2,500. So, so I just made that motion. Motion. Uh, is there a seconder for that motion? Seconded by Councillor Phil. Any more questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded. Motion carried. Uh, request, for, request for decision on uh, lost or stolen cards. Okay, so Caroline's done a nice request for decision. It's basically to charge a $5 fee. If anybody loses, they're, re, they're, re, they're reloadable transit pass. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, motion carried. Um, that was easy. Councillor Phil had a, 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 an item, Phil. So a solicitor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'd like to make a motion. The town of Yarmouth send its most heartfelt congratulations on Greg Barrow's well-deserved well Queen's Council appointment. QC. <laughs> that's, that's the next motion. That's why it's yeah. a good idea to get the motion. He's automatically ahead of time. smarter now. <laughs> so yeah. moved by Councillor Phil, seconded by Sandy. Councillor Sandy, all questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, motion carried. Congratulations, um, Greg. Yes, thank you. Now, uh, Phil, <coughs> Phil, you're under open streets. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'd like to make a motion that staff explore and or implement the switch open the streets option. And I think everybody got the, Caroline, did you send that to everybody only to a, I'd like you to send that to everybody and I'll just maybe come up and say a couple of words about the switch open the streets. Interesting concept. So switch open street is um, this really cool regular event that happens in Halifax <coughs> and it, 
it was um, implemented by some planners who was looking to uh, generate traffic and, um, in different areas in the city. Uh, pedestrian traffic, foot traffic, not cars, and uh, allow for some small local businesses and like, just engaging opportunities on the weekends for, for um, residents. So the idea is they close down a street, they put up pylons, they invite retailers or um, different people who might want to offer classes, they have street, walk, street chalk and food Last and all food. that kind of stuff, and they just open the street up on Sundays to the people. They give it back to people instead of cars. Do it down there. Plus, the other thing, I was thinking yeah. maybe even something if you could, uh, I think it's a great idea, and I always like to see it implemented, but if you did something maybe between Grand Street and Parade Street and incorporate uh, Frost Park and do something like the old fireman's picnic and fair that they used to have behind, <coughs> behind, behind the library might be a great idea for a community group or an organization, uh, Sea Fest, uh, you know, the antique car show, somebody to really get behind and really push it. And I think it would be a great addition. And I think you could do it, you know, you could do a, uh, Maybe up on uh, Brunswick Street Extension one day, you could do a thousand meter, thousand yard yard sale with a band on one end and something else. But I think something that could be explored and it's something that was brought out to other community groups or organizations that would be uh, something neat and inter interactive in the town of Yarmouth. But you're going to send that information out to all the other councillors that, can do that it hasn't right got now. that? Good. I, no, that's right. That's right. I just, I just have a, qu a question as a citizen. So we are given permission, but we're not organizing the events. The events are going to be uh, get permission from the town to, uh, to use, say, John Street or, or uh, Second Street on a certain day, or as, yeah. as Councillor Phil has suggested. And, and then they, we would do our part, but not actually organize any events. Yeah, that's the idea. This, the, we kind of offer to close down the street at no cost mm -hmm. on a certain time and day, and then the community kind of rallies around it and does whatever they'd like to do with the street. So we have a motion. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, we I have a motion for policy. Yeah, it'll be subject to policy. Yeah, uh, Councillor Cannon. This this has come up before, and if I'm my recollection is right, I remember the historical society wanted to do that if i'm i can be corrected but i remember a number of years ago but the traffic authority said that was not permissible that he could not do that um because I remember they have a huge um sale every year the yard sale massive yard sale now they have since moved it to zion baptist and one of the reasons was because the street congested or the former zion baptist property i should say uh, they they moved it because they couldn't get that street closed so i'm just wondering i'm wondering if the traffic authority is going to permit that or not no, I'd suggest the policy be developed in conjunction with the traffic authority. If he has any particular streets or scenarios where he wouldn't want a street closed, then just work that into the policy. Yeah. So you've heard the discussion. Any more questions? Question being called. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, motion carried. Um, item uh, 9E, budget, uh, Jeff. So I have a presentation, it'll take about 45 minutes. Um, I'm about 45. If, you, if it, 45, if there's no questions. <laughs> now, now we, we could defer it. We could defer, well, I'm suggesting we defer it. <laughs> Go ahead, your worship. I, I wouldn't mind making a motion to defer it. And I actually, in all honesty, I said to Jeff yesterday, it's going to be a long meeting. I didn't even think he'd have time to pull this together. So good on you for doing that because of all the water stuff. We want to take care of that first. So can we defer it? Is it appropriate for a separate meeting? Uh, no, we'll, uh, we'll tie it into what okay. you can meet. Okay. All right. And to Ken's point, we're, we'll get the dates out too as soon as possible. Yeah. So, so yeah. So just a reminder for everybody to send the dates that you're not available if we're going away in the next couple months that you're aware of now, get those to Linda. Yeah, good. To, to get the dates, any dates that you're not available in the next couple months, send them to Linda as soon as possible. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, yeah. 
Okay. Good. Thank you, Deputy. Is there uh, no, no in-camera items? And uh, at this point, maybe a motion for adjournment?